Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. October 27th, we were working the day watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. An unidentified woman had been found murdered in a hotel room. The cause of death was strangulation. There was no lead to the identity of the killer. We had to find him. Well, this is all of it. Did you find anything we can get a lead out of? Nothing too good, no. I don't think you could identify her from what we've got here. Morgan post the body yet? Yeah, this morning. How about fingerprints, Ray? They find any in the hotel room? Checked with Bergman. No foreign prints. No, dead end there. What about the woman's purse? Did it show anything? No chance. You can see this fabric here. File. Won't take a print. Contents of the purse, usual stuff. Mm-hmm. Comb. Lipstick. Keychain. One key on it. Half package of chewing gum. Coin purse with a dime and two nickels in it. That's all of it. Well, according to the room clerk at the hotel, she had a wallet with her when she checked in there. No sign of that, huh? No, no sign of it in the hotel room, either. Checked everything. Is that the only piece of jewelry found on the body, that wedding ring there? Yeah. It's a cheap ring. No markings on it. No way of tracing it. About the only thing I can tell you, she was pretty well dressed. That's an expensive bag there. Sure not a cheap dress, either. Same for a coat and shoes. They cost money, too. How about labels on any of that stuff, Ray? Yeah, Joe. There's one on the coat here. You can see it right here. Benless Department Store, Los Angeles. Coat's fairly new. They might be able to give you something on it. Yeah, maybe. The people at the hotel. Did you get anything there? Well, it could have been a little better. The woman checked in last night around 8 o'clock. She registered as John Ross and wife, L.A. Anyone see the man with her? No, nobody. The room clerk says a woman came in alone. Said her husband was parking the car, so she registered for both of them. Mm-hmm. Clerk said he left the desk a few minutes after that. Figures a man must have come in sometime while he was gone. Nobody on duty at the desk after midnight. Could have left the hotel at any time after that without being seen. She registered at 8 p.m. Coroner said she died about 10.30. You're not even sure there was a man with her, are you? Yeah. The woman who was next door to the murder room. She told us she heard a man and woman arguing. That was about 10 o'clock. Said it got pretty loud. No idea who the woman really was, huh? I don't suppose that John Ross and wife business means anything. That's pretty doubtful, Ray. About all we got to go on is the physical description from the coroner. She was a small woman. Five foot one, 91 and a quarter pounds, brown hair, blue eyes, about 31 or 32 years old. We got her prints off to Washington. You got any ideas? Well, it might be a psycho killer. How do you figure? Well, the coroner's report listed strangulation as the cause of death. Yeah. Whoever did it made sure her neck was broken. <laughs> At approximately 6 o'clock that morning in a second-floor room of a downtown hotel, the body of an unidentified woman was found murdered. Preliminary investigation failed to reveal the true identity of the victim or the killer. As far as physical evidence was concerned, there wasn't much to go on. The deep bruises on her neck and throat, along with the crushed vertebrae at the base of her skull, indicated a savage attack. 1.55 p.m. Through the label on the dead woman's coat, we traced the garment to the department store where it had been purchased, but they had no record on it. It was a cash purchase, and the sales girl couldn't remember the customer. Investigation during the next two days failed to turn up any leads. We showed a morgue picture of the victim to bartenders, waitresses, parking lot attendants in the vicinity of the hotel. They couldn't identify her. We rechecked tenants and employees at the hotel. It got us nothing. Thursday, 5.48 p.m. Sure got me stopped. Two days of leg work, and we're in no place. Well, we might be in better shape when we get that kickback from Washington. Sure hope so. The victim was a nice-looking woman, well-dressed, nice clothes. How come she'd stay in a cheap hotel in a neighborhood like that? Doesn't jive for my money. Well, it's hard to say. Uh, excuse me. Yes, sir, can we help you? Well, I don't know. I guess that just depends. I'm waiting to see a couple of detectives here. Well, who'd you want to see? A couple of detectives. Who are they? Well, this is pretty confidential, you know. I have to talk to them myself. They told me to see Friday and Smith. Frank Friday and Joe Smith. Detectives, they're handling the case. Well, yes, sir. I'm Joe Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. 
What can we do for you? Well, Fred, uh, they say that you're working on that murder case, that woman who was found in the hotel. Yes, sir, that's right. Mm -hmm. Can I see your badges? Yes, sir. Here. That looks authentic. There's my ID card. May I? Yeah. Nice likeness. Hmm. Type O. Good blood. Now, I've been reading about that murder in the papers. You're gonna thank me for this. I got all you want to know about that murder. You mind telling us your name, sir? I don't mind. L.P. Morgan. I was a good friend of hers, you know. Used to work with her. You mean the dead woman? Same one. Never forget a face. Maud McLeod. I saw that picture in the paper and I said to myself, there's old Maud. You pretty sure of that, are you, Mr. Morgan? Sure, I'm sure. Maud McLeod. We used to work together in the circus. Maud was a bareback girl, you know. Best in the country. Real trooper. Well, now, what makes you so sure it's the same woman, Mr. Morgan? When was the last time you saw this friend of yours, this Maud McLeod? Oh, I used to see her all the time. Worked the old cells floater together. I got a picture of her. Do you mind if we take a look at it? Well, that's why I came down here. I want to help out. She's got to be identified. See, I got her here somewhere. I know. I was curious. Carson City. in your circus costume. Awful pretty. Take a look at that. That's Maud, ain't it? Well, I don't know, sir. This is a drawing. There doesn't seem to be much resemblance there. Is that right? I'm afraid you've made a mistake, Mr. Morgan. Thanks for your cooperation, anyway. Appreciate you coming in. I was sure it was Maud. I get it. Homicide Friday. Oh, yeah, Ed. Uh-huh. Is that right? What'd it say? Uh-huh. Okay, fine. Yeah, well, we'll pick it up. Thank you. Anything? Communications. They just got the kickback from Washington on the dead woman's fingerprints. Any luck? Yeah, they got her identified. Worked in an aircraft plant during the war. Her name's Doris Frazier. I can't help but think you fellas are missing the bet. I know that dead woman. Oh, no, sir. She's already been identified, Mr. Morgan. We know who she is. Her name's Doris Frazier. That's so? Yes, sir. That's right. Well, what do you know about that? Old Maud. She went and changed her name. Thursday, 6.35 p.m. Frank and I went down the hall to communications and got a copy of the kickback from Washington. The murder victim was identified as Doris Allen Frazier. She applied for a position as a typist at the Eagle Aircraft plant in Burbank in 1942. Next morning, we checked the personnel office at the plant, and we found that Doris Frazier had been employed as a typist from 1942 to 1944. In going over her application, we found her last known address listed as 7346 Oakdale Avenue. Her application stated she was single, with no previous employment, with no known relatives. We could uncover no further information on the girl. We drove across town to the Oakdale Avenue address, a large apartment building in a better than average neighborhood. The manager told us that Doris Frazier had lived there up to 18 months before. He said that a few weeks before she moved, she was married, but he was unable to remember the name of her husband. The manager also told us that the newly married couple apparently began having trouble from the day they were married. We checked the next forwarding address, a boarding house for women in the southwest end of the city. Frank and I interviewed the woman in charge, a Mrs. Frances Watson. We talked to her in the dining room of the boarding house, where she was polishing a set of silverware. Well, of course, when she first came here, we didn't know it, but she was married. This is a home for single girls. And we have our rules and regulations, just like any other respectable place. Yes, ma'am. Well, as we came to find out later, Doris wasn't only married, but she was fighting with her husband. I understand he wasn't much at all. She was thinking of getting a divorce, as a matter of fact. Did you ever meet her husband, Ms. Watson? No, I never did. I suppose it's just as well I didn't. I understand that Doris left him after they'd been married only a few months. Uh-huh. Do you know what his name is, ma'am? No, I have no idea. Doris always used her maiden name when she was with me. And you never saw the man, Mrs. Watson? He never came to the house here? No, I didn't say I never saw him. I said I didn't meet him. 
Yes, there was once when he came to the house to see Doris. Well, what was the occasion? Would you mind telling us about it? Well, it was most unpleasant, I can tell you that. Let me see now. Yes, Doris had been here about six months. Even by that time, I was beginning to see the real side of the girl. No character, officer. No character at all. It shows up every time. Yes, ma'am. Would you go on, please? Well, as I was saying, it was after about six months when this man brought Doris home late one night. About a quarter till midnight, I'd say. Upset the whole house. Well, how was that, ma'am? The two of them, this man and Doris, they stood right out in the hall there. They had a terrible quarrel. The language, it was dreadful. At the top of their lungs, too. My husband went out to quiet them down, but the man left before he had a chance to call him down. Upset the whole house. Mm -hmm. This man that the Fraser woman was arguing with, you sure it was her husband? Well, as sure as I can be. That's what Doris told me anyway the day after. I called her in and told her I just couldn't tolerate behavior like that. It upset her quite a bit, I remember. She cried, said it wouldn't happen again. That's when she told me she was trying to get a divorce. Was well, that what the big argument was about, would you know? Yes, she said she wanted the divorce. Her husband didn't. He wanted her back with him. Certainly is sad the way some people mix up their lives. Yes, ma'am. By any chance, did you ever get a good look at this man, the husband, I mean? Well, he was tall and had dark hair. That's about all I remember. He was well-dressed, too. I see. When Doris Fraser left here, Mrs. Watson, did she leave any forwarding address with you? No, she didn't. I haven't any idea where she moved. What kind of work was she doing while she was living here? Do you have any idea where she was employed? Yes, that was one of the references she gave me. Furniture company down on Venice Boulevard, if I remember correctly. I have the address in my record book. Certainly is unfortunate, the whole thing. Yes, ma'am, it is. I even tried to talk to her before she left. Sat her down and talked to her for a whole afternoon. Guess it was just a waste of time. Well, how's that, ma'am? The trouble with her husband, terrible thing. He seemed to treat her so badly. Two of them fighting all the time. I believe she was actually afraid of him. She told me he was very jealous. He drank, ran around. That's why I couldn't understand it. Couldn't understand what, ma'am? Doris, when she moved away from here. Yeah. She said she was going back with her husband. The landlady, Frances Watson, gave us the address of the furniture store where the murder victim had been employed, and we drove down to check with the personnel manager, a Mr. Collins. He said Doris Frazier had been fired from her job ten months before. He said she'd been let out because she was constantly late for work and that she got into the habit of asking for salary advances too often. Collins also told us that he'd heard about the trouble between the Frazier woman and her husband. He said he'd seen the husband in the store several times when he came to call for his wife. He identified the husband as Stephen Arnold. The personnel manager gave us the last known address they had on the victim. The following morning, we checked it out, an apartment hotel in the East Wilshire area. She was still registered there, together with her husband, Stephen Arnold. But the desk clerk told us that Arnold hadn't been living there for the past three months. He had no idea where Arnold had moved, and he didn't know where he worked. While the desk clerk stood by, Frank and I went upstairs and checked the apartment. Did you find anything, Joe? Not too much, no. Well, there's nothing in the bedroom. Like Ray says, she likes nice things, but that's about all I can figure. Mm -hmm. What you got there? Looks like a letter she started, and she didn't finish it. It's dated October 23rd. What's it say? Dear George, I've been meaning to write you before. That's all. That's as far as she got. George, huh? That's the first time we've run to that name on this deal. Yeah. It means there's more than one man in her life. Mm -hmm. A few more letters and bills here. All unopened. Yeah. Ad from a woman's store. Another ad, telephone bill, postcard. Here's one postmark Santa Monica. Check the name on that return. Yeah, Stephen Arnold. <laughs> PM. We called the office and checked Stephen Arnold through R and I. He had no criminal record. The return address, which he'd listed on the envelope of the letter to his wife, was 10826 Pacific Front Boulevard. We located it on the beach just below Santa Monica. It was a small dark concession owned and operated by the dead woman's husband. No, I haven't seen Doris for a couple of months anyway. Why? I understand you had an apartment with your wife in the East Wilshire neighborhood. Is that right, Mr. Arnold? Yeah, that's right. You mind telling us why you left? No, I don't mind. I wanted to move closer to my work, that's all. That place was way too far out. How is it your wife didn't move out with you, sir? She wanted to stay close to town. She doesn't care much for the beach. Bad for her sinus. Did you have an argument with your wife, Arnold? Some kind of a disagreement? Is that one of the reasons you moved? Yeah, you might call it that. We're getting a divorce. Is that so? Yeah. 
It was the best thing all the way around. It's been nothing but fighting and scrapping all last year anyway. We decided to call it quits. Say, would you excuse me a minute? I got some cold drinks in this cooler here. Uh, would either of you like a cool drink? No, no, no thanks. Are you getting the divorce from your wife, Arnold? Yeah, that's right. I'm divorcing her. Why'd you want to know? Well, you remember that last time you saw your wife, the exact date, I mean? No, I don't think I remember that. It's been at least three months, I'll say that much. You spend most of your time down here at the beach, Mr. Arnold? Yeah, that's right. I get in town a couple of times a month. Sure you wouldn't like a cold drink? No, thank no, you. Thank you. I'll have one myself, if you don't mind. This water sure keeps it nice and cool. Yes, sir. How about last Tuesday night? Were you in town that night? No. Last time was two or three weeks ago, anyway. Went in to see a show. I was working here last Tuesday night. Work here every night except Monday. That's the only night I'm closed up. Mm-hmm. Is there anyone who can vouch for that? I don't think I get this. Why do you want to know? Well, is there anybody who can vouch for you? Sure. Half a dozen people, anyway. The fellow who runs the place next door. The guys in the rest of the stalls up and down the way here. They can all vouch for me. I worked here till 1 a.m., same as usual. Uh, just a minute. Hey, Vic. Vic. Yes, Steve? Come on over here a moment, will you? These fellas are detectives, Vic. I guess it's something about a jam my wife got herself into. They want to know where I was last Tuesday night. Yeah? They want somebody to vouch for me. Sure. Did you see Arnold last Tuesday night? I was working next door. Steve was here all night. <laughs> Saturday, October 31st, 2 p.m. Frank and I checked with a dozen different concession operators in the neighborhood of Stephen Arnold's place. They all corroborated the fact that on the night his wife had met her death in a downtown hotel, Arnold had been working at his stand until 1 a.m. Despite all the previous indications that he might have been responsible for the murder of his wife, we had to eliminate him as a possible suspect. 2.20 p.m. On the way back into town, we stopped by the apartment hotel where Doris Frazier was living at the time of her murder. After checking further with tenants and with the help in the building, we found out that the victim had been in the habit of eating most of her meals at restaurants in the immediate neighborhood. After some two hours and six restaurants later, we found a small coffee shop four blocks from the apartment building where one of the waitresses identified Doris Frazier's picture. Yeah, that's her officer. Terrible picture, though. She looks so much older. About how often would you say Miss Frazier came in here, ma'am? Oh, three or four times a week, I'd say. The bus stop is right out there on the corner. She'd usually have breakfast and then grab the bus and go to work. Some nights coming home from work, she'd stop here for dinner. Nice girl. Quiet. Did you get to know her at all, miss? I mean, do you happen to know any of her friends in the neighborhood? No, as I say, she was a quiet person, not very talkative. Usually read while she was eating. A magazine or a book. Did she ever come in here with anyone else, would you know? Oh, yes, quite a few times. She seemed to have the boyfriends. Of course, she was attractive. Small, you know, but real cute looking. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know any of these men? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Any one of them in particular that she came in with very often? Let's see. I think there was one. Dark, uh, well-dressed, uh, kind of tall, good-looking. They usually came in together for breakfast. How long ago was this, miss, would you recall? Oh, I'd say up till a couple of weeks ago. I usually waited on them in the morning. That's how I happen to remember. I see. Did you ever happen to hear this man's name? Let me see. George, I think that was it, yeah. Would you happen to know if he lives in the neighborhood? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Has this man been in here during the past week, do you know? Yes, he has. He came in for breakfast. What day was that? This morning. Before we left the coffee shop, we questioned the cashier who came up with the information that the man known as George usually left his car parked at the service station across the street. We left our card and asked the cashier to call us in case the suspect returned. <laughs> At the service station, they also remembered the man known as George, but they told us that he hadn't been in for the past two weeks. They'd done some work on his car for him in the past, so they had a record of his license number. We called our DMV and found that the car was registered to a Carl Lucy in East Hollywood. 4.30 p.m. We drove out and interviewed Lucy at his home, but he came nowhere near the description of the suspect. He told us that he had purchased the car six weeks before from a man known as George Crane. He described Crane as tall, dark, and well-dressed. From the bill of sale, we got Crane's address, a motel on East Manchester. The manager there told us that George Crane had moved a week before. He said that Crane had left no forwarding address, but he did remember where he worked. He gave us the name of the aircraft company in the San Fernando Valley. We called their personnel office, but they were closed for the day. 
Description checks out all the way. You called the night office of the aircraft company, did you? Yeah, they couldn't tell us anything. Gave us the home number of the personnel manager. Well, he's got a record. I got the package on him here. Yeah. Nothing very heavy. Drunk charge two years ago, another one last year. Disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, that's about all. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. Who? How's that? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. No, no, I'm afraid not. Well, we sure. Certainly. Yes, we are. Yes, sir. Thanks, anyway. Right. Right. Well, that does it. Who was it? You know, that guy was in here the other day, that Al P. Morgan? Yeah, what do he want? He wanted to buy us a drink. He's celebrating. Huh? His old friend Maud. He just found her. Sunday, November 1st, 8 a.m. We got in touch with the manager of the personnel department of the aircraft company at his home. He said that he'd check the files for us. 8.42 a.m. He called back to tell us that George Crane was employed as a maintenance man in the electrical department, that he'd been working for the company for the past five years, and that he had a good employment record. He told us he was on the day shift, and that he was scheduled to report for work in the generator room at 8 o'clock that morning. got in the car and drove out to the valley where we located the murder suspect, George Crane, at work in the generator room of the aircraft factory. Do you know a Doris Fraser? Doris Fraser? No, oh, I'm sorry, officers. I don't know anybody by that name. How about Doris Arnold? Do you know that name? Arnold? No, I'm afraid not. What's it all about? You own a car? Yeah. Dark sedan. Had it very long? A couple of weeks. Last one I had was giving me a lot of trouble. Did you trade it in? No, I sold it to a private party. Fell out in Hollywood. How about this picture? You know her? Well, it doesn't look like anybody I know. I suppose to? You should, yeah. I don't follow you. You spent any time around the East Wilshire district, Crane? East Wilshire? No, I've probably been over there a couple of times. Not lately, though. How about the coffee shop in the corner of Gramercy and Marengo? Ever been in there? Not that I remember, no. Well, a waitress in that coffee shop, and the cashier, too, say they got a pretty regular customer, and he fits your description exactly. You sure you've never been in there? Well, I'm not positive. I wouldn't swear I'd never been in the place. What's the difference, anyway? How about the service station across the street from the coffee shop? You ever park your car there? They ever do any work on it for you? Oh, say, I better know the place you're talking about. Yeah, I've been by there a few times, sure. It's a good station. Done a lot of good jobs on my car for me. Yeah, I remember it now. Then I guess you remember the coffee shop. Crane? Yeah, I think I do now. Right across the street from the station? Yeah, that's right. Well, what do you want to know about it? When's the last time you were in there, Crane? Well, to tell the truth, I couldn't be sure. We talked to a waitress in there yesterday. Said you were in that morning for breakfast. Do you remember that? Uh, she's way off her track on that one, I can tell you that. I wasn't near the place yesterday morning. The cashier remembers you, too. She says you were in. Now, how about it, Crane? Look, what difference does it make? What's this thing all about, anyway? You want to take another look at that picture? I told you once, I don't know the woman. I never saw her before in my life. Why don't you give it some thought? Huh? You remembered East Wilshire. You remembered the service station. You finally remembered the coffee shop. Maybe you can remember her, too, huh? I don't know her. I never saw her in my life. Usually came in for breakfast. And you stopped going there about two weeks ago. What do you figure she's got to do with me anyway? We checked her apartment, mister. We found a letter she was writing to you. You ready to tell us? Well, what's a letter? That doesn't mean anything. Can't prove anything by a letter. What are you thinking anyway? We think you're lying, Crane. We think you got a reason for it. Now, what do you say? It doesn't prove anything. Maybe I knew her. It doesn't mean anything at all. We think it does. Yeah? We think you killed her. That the way it looks to you? That's the way it looks. I don't think you can prove it. We're gonna try. Now, how about it? Will it go any easier for me if I admit it? That's not up to us. I don't know why I did it. What am I going to give for a reason? I wouldn't know, Crane. I don't know why I killed her. Sounds funny, doesn't it? No reason at all, I just killed her. What am I going to tell him? If I don't have a reason, how can I ask him to let me off easy? How can I ask him? I don't know, but they'll have an answer. February 8th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree.